Coming up on DTNS, praise and awards for lithium-ion batteries, good news for pets in Uber, and hair-raising tales of phishing scams. This is the Daily Tech News for Wednesday, October 9th, 2019 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Feline, I'm Sarah Lane. And from Salt Lake City, Utah, I'm Scott Johnson. And I'm Roger Chang, the show's producer. Uh, we were just having a rollicking conversation about bald people and why they should not be ashamed of it. And you should also not pull their hats off to see if they're bald. That's on Good Day Internet. Become a member and get that episode and more at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Oh, play that. Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg will testify before the U.S. House Financial Services Committee on October 23rd in a hearing titled... An examination of Facebook and its impact on the financial services and housing sectors. Questions are expected to focus on the Libra cryptocurrency as well as housing advertisements. Epic Games told The Verge, quote, Epic supports everyone's right to express their views on politics and human rights. We wouldn't ban or punish a Fortnite player for content creators, or excuse me, or content creators for speaking on these topics. Unquote. Fortnite is available in China through a partnership with Tencent. The state-run Chinese newspaper People's Daily accused Apple of endorsing and protecting rioters after Apple reversed a decision to block the HK Map Live app. Uh, that's the one we talked about previously that takes info from Telegram to show locations of police and tear gas usage on a map of Hong Kong. Uh, the opinion piece from People's Daily said that approving the app made Apple an accomplice in protests in Hong Kong. Analyst Ming-Chi Kuo's latest report predicts that in Q1 of 2020, Apple will release an iPhone SE2 and also an iPad Pro with a 3D sensor for AR support. Kuo also believes that Apple will release an augmented reality headset in cooperation with third-party brands and a MacBook with a scissor switch keyboard in Q2 of 2020 as well. All right. Oh, and uh, something that's actually happening right now from Apple is they sell the Microsoft Xbox wireless controller for 60 bucks right there on the old Apple Store website. Apple added support for the Xbox controller as well as Sony's DualShock 4 in the latest major software updates for iPhone, iPad, Apple TV, and the Mac. Uh, they ain't selling the DualShock 4 yet, um, but there, you can buy a Microsoft product once again right there at Apple.com. It's crazy. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty good. Uh, let's talk a little bit about lithium-ion batteries, Scott. Sure. Uh, real quick, a correction to earlier. Uh, it's important to mention that Tencent owns about 40% of Epic Games overall, not just their partner in, in China, before people send you emails. You mean uh, they're an investor in 40% of the stock? Is that right? Yes. Well, they basically absorbed 40% of the developer itself. So they are a majority owner of Epic Games, no matter where they are in the world. So it's it's even making that story even more significant, I think, that they're taking that particular stand. Uh, anyway, for a different day. The Nobel Prize for Chemistry was awarded to three scientists who work on lithium-ion batteries. You know, the stuff in your phone and everything else you have. Stanley Whittingham developed the first functional lithium-ion battery. John Goodenough, that's his name, replaced the titanium, uh, I can't say that right, disulfide in the, in the cathode and cobalt <laughs> oxide to double the voltage produced, making it more powerful. In other words, it wasn't good enough. <laughs> anyway... <laughs> I stole that joke from Tom. I have to give him full credit. Right. Uh, not that it's a hard one, but anyway. Blame me. <laughs> Akiro Yoshino, Yoshino rather, housed the anode and petroleum coke, making it safe for general use. These three scientists will share the award. At 97 years old, good enough becomes the oldest laureate to receive a Nobel Prize in any discipline. Yeah, I thought this was a really uh, nice nice time to to. Say something nice about lithium ion batteries. We all complain about, you know, the capacity of lithium ion batteries and how, you know, occasionally they still do explode uh, in rare instances. And gosh, wouldn't it be great if we had a different battery solution that wasn't lithium ion? But imagine a world a without world, lithium yeah, ion right, batteries right. at all, right? Yeah. yeah, I mean, in when we look back on this time, it'll be, oh, remember when we all used lithium ion. But there was a time before this, before these scientists, uh, you know, all 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 made something that that ended up creating technology that that people depend on and use every day. And yes, it's going to get better over time. And it already is. But man, at 97 years old, John Goodenough becoming the oldest laureate to receive a Nobel Prize in any discipline. Good on you, John. More than good enough. Yeah. yeah, it's uh, I mean, well better, be better than I, I think it's really cool because as much as we and Tom, you'd said this earlier this morning on the TMS segment, as much as we 
not complain, but we kind of moan a little bit that battery tech hasn't gotten much further very fast uh, compared to other technologies. And we just sort of are having to, to rely on the stuff that these guys came up with. But if you think about it, it's still so much better. I mean, I remember the NICAD batteries and I remember the garbage that came before that that I had to power devices with before we had better battery tech. And it was a nightmare scenario. So as much as I would love to see whatever the next step is, pretty good step these guys yeah. made. We we may not think lithium ion batteries are good enough now, uh, but uh, think about how many rechargeable batteries you have in your house right now. And and those devices would not be possible with with NICAD batteries uh, even in a lot of cases, and certainly not before any kind of rechargeable battery came along. All right, uh, I double checked. Uh, you are right. Forty percent owner of Epic is Tencent, but Tim Sweeney is still the majority owner. Correct. Uh, at greater than fifty, uh, you had said Tencent was a majority. But oh, I not. see what you mean. Yeah. yeah, he and that gives him the. He's the guy behind the quote as well. Right. So it gives him a lot more power, I guess, to say. Yeah, stuff. yeah. He is more than fifty percent, so he controls the company. Uh, open Libra is an open source currency platform formed by several blockchain companies and nonprofits including Interchain Foundation and the Danish Red Cross, as an alternative to Facebook's Libra project. Open Libra is concerned that the Libra system, while distributed, is not decentralized, and because of that, will enrich the few corporations that are part of the governance board. Uh, Open Libra calls it a plutocracy that's going to benefit from this, and says it, quote, aims to be technically, move language, and financially compatible, Libra coin, embracing what is powerful, but also replacing what's concerning in a non-adversarial way. So it sounds like what Open Libra wants to do is take all the open source bits of Libra that, that Facebook's project is going to offer and create a system that can't be controlled by a small number of companies. They're saying, that's the one thing we really are worried about. So we're going to try to create a system that is open from that. Well, and, you know, my gut reaction was sort of like, or my first reaction anyway, was like, oh, this might actually be a better way that Facebook could go forward with Libra, right? Because they've they've, sure. they've had some cold feet, but the cold feet are from big financial institutions that wouldn't necessarily have any interest in something like Open Libra. Yeah, you've got to make the companies feel like it's worth the profit for them to risk the regulatory scrutiny it's going to take to get into bed with Facebook. So sadly, I don't think Facebook gets into Open Libra, but Open Libra is betting that Libra will happen. They're saying, we don't think Libra fails, even with all the scrutiny. And they're trying to say, we want to make something better out of it. And we're, we're going we're gonna to ride in the wake of Libra and try to provide a counterbalance. Uh, to me, everything in open Libra is the stuff I like about Libra, and the stuff I don't like about Libra isn't there. So I'm, I'm kind of on board with this. The thing is, if you kind of need Libra to happen for open Libra to work, I think. Oh, see, so that's an interesting take. You can't, you can't have open, it's kind of like, you can't have open office if well, there's not already an office you had to pay for to provide the open source option. That's better for a lot of people. I mean, it's not exactly the same because open office is a different code base. Uh, whereas open Libra is actually using some of the stuff like the move language that, that Libra makes possible. So it's e even closer than that. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about pets and transporting our pets. Uber Pet will become an option available in Austin, Denver, Nashville, Minneapolis, St. Paul, Philadelphia, Phoenix, and Tampa Bay, all in the U.S., starting October 16th. Now, Uber currently lets drivers decide if they're willing to take pets on board, so they can say yes or no. Drivers that don't may cancel rides after they've already been booked when they learn of the pet. So... Uber pet will cost three to five dollars more per ride unless the pet is a service animal. Yeah. Now this this is this literally uh, was the reason because before before now Uber again the driver reserves the right to say yes or no but you don't really it was always a little bit clunky like you didn't really know if they were okay with it until you already booked the ride and if they weren't okay with it well that's fine it's their car but. Often, you know, if you're in a hurry, that sort of thing. This single thing kept me from trying to live a car-free life. Yeah, because it's not that most Uber drivers would even say no if you have your cat in a cat carrier and you're going to the vet or something like that, right? Yeah. But they could. 
Because if someone's allergic, that driver may be like, you know what, right. I'd love to take your cat, but I'm just going to sneeze the whole time. It's not going to be good. It's not safe. Uh, I'm sorry. You'll have to get an, another car. So this says, if you don't want to worry about that, you can still do it the old way. You can still sure. just book a regular Uber, not pay the extra. But if you're like, you know what, I just want to make sure that I've got an Uber driver that's going to be okay with pets, they're giving you an option to pay a couple more bucks to, to get that reassurance. Yeah, and when you think about like, well, you know, I mean, okay, I mean, is this really that big a deal? Usually it's not. But what if your pet has an emergency and has mm -hmm. to go to like a 24-hour vet? These are the sorts of situations where you can't have an Uber driver like come into the house and be like, oh, I can't do this, you know, and, and you wasting, pr pr you know, precious minutes or hours, you know, trying to get to something. It's the emergency part of it that um, has always uh, concerned me to the point that I was like, oh, you just need a car. You just have to have a car, depending on where you live, of course, you know, uh, you could be within walking distance to your vet and maybe this wouldn't uh, be an issue. But you know, it also applies to like, I don't know, going to the beach or you know, all sorts of things. Um, I, have, I have questions that go, <laughs> my brain always does this, but is it any different if I have a giant great Dane, Dane versus like a little, you know. I think it does. Yeah, I think I think that. Oh, I, well, I have, you, if you're paying, no, it doesn't. They're, they're like, is you, if I, you're paying the extra money, you get to bring your pet. Okay. That, that's so if, I right, pay, yeah. if I pay the three to five bucks, they don't care if it's a poodle or a Great Dane. It's That's the price. If yeah, I'm the driver has said it's okay to have a pet. Oh. Yeah. But it does matter when you're trying to, you know, perhaps get your dog on board the old-fashioned way. And I know this because this has happened to me a couple of times where an Uber driver, you know, you book the ride. And then I call and say, just, you know, heads up. Got a, uh, got a dog. Is that okay? And they were like, yeah, sure. Uh, how big, you know, I'm like 80 pounds. And then it's like, no, nah, that's yeah. actually not okay. Now here's the thing though. <laughs> Should they be charging for this? I mean, I, I think having a service that, that lets you sift this is great. But should it just be part of the option of like, hey, you know, I also want to select uh, a quiet ride or something like that, which they also put in a higher price tier, by the way. But, you know, should are you punishing pet owners by making them charge three to five dollars? Mm. I mean, if you're if your big St. Bernard gets in my car and drops a duder in the back seat. I'm going to I'm going to be glad that I at least got an extra 5 bucks out of those people. I'm sure that's what this is for is to appease. Well, do and also do the drivers get an extra 3 or 5 bucks out of it? Well, them? yeah, good point. And that's the other question, right? Yeah. Researchers from Fortinet have found an unauthenticated unauthenticated command injection vulnerability in four models of D-Link routers that could permit remote code ex execution. D-Link told Fortinet that the four vulnerable router models are end of life and will not receive updates to patch the vulnerability. Two of the models were discontinued last year, so less than a year old for lots of people when they bought them not discontinued, and three of them are still on sale on Amazon despite being discontinued. So people who don't realize might buy a router that is going to remain insecure. Uh, this is unconscionable. There is no excuse for D-Link to not patch this. I understand security is expensive. I understand end of lifing a model, but if you just end of life to model, you should still provide security updates for a period of time afterwards. A router should last five to eight years, not one or less than one year. I, I find no sympathy for D-Link in this. Uh, this, is, this is just, uh, something that they need to reverse course and it, issue a patch for it. If they don't Plain reverse simple. course, I am, I've got D-Link hardware. I will get rid of it and get something to replace it because I am annoyed. And I don't mean this in some sort of let's rise up and stick it to the man kind of way, like straight up no, that no. brand I won't trust anymore. Like that is, that is bad, bad business. Bad. I don't want to buy from a company that might stop supporting it next week. I mean, literally, that. I, okay, it's not next week. It's not that bad. But in six months, like someone who who bought a D-Link router last year in less than a year has had it end of life and now there is a security vulnerability. And I think this is why it really sticks in my craw is router vulnerabilities are one of the biggest ways that malware get into unsuspecting right. users' systems. Routers need to be the safest 
part of any device that you have. They need to be the most bulletproof of devices. They have been unconscionably insecure in the past for multiple reasons, and they should be securing themselves more, not saying, well, we just ended life that last year, so no, we're not going to support it. Yeah, not not a chance, D-Link. That's, you either reverse that, or I, I can't imagine that it's just our voices that feel this way. And even yeah, if you it, have it, it seems like there. at the very least being like, well, it's not for sale anymore would be at least a way that you might get around this. But if it, it, if a router is for sale, I might buy it new and be like, okay, this is my new router. Right, right. And, and now and everything's going to go to hell in a handbasket. You're not going to care that D-Link says, well, that was just remaining inventory in the supply channel. Yeah, like, we can't I be responsible that, for that. And, and they're not going to communicate that to me at Best Buy. Totally. Yeah, they also yeah. have, I mean, I, I would just say, I'm not saying everybody needs to follow Microsoft example in this, but when they go end of life with an operating system in terms of support, they do it way, way in advance. And then it's a huge amount of time between the time it, they, they say they will and when they actually do the cutoff. And even then we've seen in recent months in the last year, they come back and go, ooh, this one's bad enough. We're still going to support that. We're going to fix yeah. that because this is right. a bad vulnerability. That's how you're supposed to do this. And I can't believe I have to use that example to give these guys a hard time, but D-Link, get your poop together. Yeah, if you don't reverse your position on this, you are the weakest, D-Link. Goodbye. <laughs> yes, goodbye. Uh, Essential has tweeted a series of pictures of a new Essential phone in the early testing called Project Gem. And if you think that's a reference to size, you might be right. Uh, the phone appears to have a long, tall aspect ratio. Imagine, for example, a iPod mini. Uh, the later generation iPod mini is a lot like this. Phone appears to have that, a fingerprint sensor on the back, a bulbous rear-facing camera, and a hole-punch selfie camera. Code snippets indicate it runs on Android and a Snapdragon 730 processor. This thing looks weird, and I, I don't know who they're selling it to. Yeah, you know, it's funny. I, I, my first reaction was like, oh, it's so long and thin. It's weird. It looks like a remote. That's what it looks like. Mm -hmm. Now, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Okay, different form factors, bring it on. You know, let's let's keep innovating. Uh, maybe there is a way to, you know, have a control panel that's sort of always on while you're looking at mobile right. sites the way that you would with another phone. Yeah, okay, but my my you know, the the first reaction is like, oh, it's it's not a large phone. It's a thin, long, small, remote-looking phone. It is. Uh, <laughs> Scott, we talked about this on TMS this morning, and Scott pulled out, uh, or I guess Brian pulled out his iPod mini. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah. And it was like, yeah, no, that's that's what this looks like, except all screen, obviously. This is, I, ha I have still, I don't use it anymore, but I have the original Essential phone. Uh, I consider this to be one of the best Android phones of its time. When it was released, it was a solid phone, worked great. The minimal changes to Android they made made sense, and it was otherwise stock, and I loved it. Uh, the attachments didn't really end up adding anything to it. I think that's part of the reason it, it didn't catch on. Uh, but maybe they felt like, well, we just made a really solid phone, and it didn't catch on. So I guess now we've got to like try one of these crazy form factors and see what works, which I'm a supporter of people trying different form factors to see if there's something left, but I'm not sure that I'm getting this one right now. I, I, I get the foldable phone more than I get this one. Yeah, oh, that's actually a really good thing to, to mention because this is this comes on the heels of all these foldable designs and, and, and we're all kind of on the fence as to whether that's the future or not. And, you know, I like that kind of stuff. I like when companies say, hey, what if, and then, we either glom onto it or we don't. Um, I, maybe I could be con convinced here, but I just, phones have gone the other way. They've gotten larger, thinner and lighter, but larger. And the larger comes in the form of a screen, which gives you more screen real estate, which makes these a more functional device for most people. Going smaller, thinner, and that narrow, I just don't know who that aspect ratio well, is. Well, and you know, it's funny that you mentioned foldable. This looks like a phone that should be folded. Right, you should be able to unfold it, right? This yeah. Yeah, because it, it's version. so long that you're like, yeah. oh, that that would be kind of cool, but you should also be able to fold it because otherwise it's it's just a, it's a strange form factor for a pocket. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe it'll uh, maybe it'll end up being unfoldable. They're like, ha ha, we fooled you all. We'll find <laughs> out. Well, folks, if you want to get all the tech headlines in about five minutes, subscribe to DailyTechHeadlines.com. Twitter thread today that uh, got some attention on Hacker News uh, from Peter Gunst, uh, co-founder and CEO of Legal.io, about his experience with a rather sophisticated phishing scam that almost fooled him. Uh, he put it out there as a cautionary tale. Here's what happened. He received a call saying it was his bank's fraud department. Now, 
My first reaction is if I get a call from the bank, I'm going to say, I'm going to hang up and call you back on a phone number I know is you. But he didn't do that. Uh, the phone number had the right area code and three-digit prefix. And he thought, well, okay, I'll talk to him. I, I don't answer the phone, but I guess Peter Goods did. So fair enough. The caller asked for Peter's member number, which he gave, realizing that the member number alone you can't do anything with. So he's like, that's probably not risk-free. Then they told him they were sending a verification pin. He got a text from his bank with the pin code, which he gave them over the phone. They then read three recent transactions and asked him to verify if they were his. And they were. He's like, oh, well, this must be the bank. They're telling me transactions. They then asked for the pin on his account in order to, in their words, put a fraud alert. That's where Peter finally said no. And what had happened was the caller used his member number to do a password reset. And apparently with this bank, which is, this is not uncommon, uh, one of the ways to do a password reset is to have a text message with a one-time code sent to your phone number that you use to log in and reset your password. Well, they did that, and they tricked him into reading that number over the phone to them. The way that's supposed to be secure is the text message only goes to you, you, <clears throat> you put the number in, and therefore we know it's you. But the workaround was they were able to use that because they got him to read the text message. So then they got into his account and were able to read transactions. They went to his statement and said, okay, we see three transactions. And so right. that gave it a little more verity, right? Sure, like, yeah, because oh, well. how would you know that otherwise? Exactly. Yeah, that, was very, yeah, uh, that was me. If he had given them the pin, they then could have transferred money out of his account, and then he would have been screwed. Uh, as it was, he hung up, immediately called his bank's fraud department, and changed his password, and everything was fine. Wow. He got right up to the edge there on that yeah, one. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we've talked about various phishing schemes over the years. I know we, we've all either fallen prey or close to it. I, I certainly have. Um, it usually has to do with the IRS. <laughs> Yeah, uh, because I don't know. I'm just a uh, I'm paranoid anyway about you know. Get making your heart sure pounded, right? Make, yeah. yeah, making sure I don't owe anybody money. But but yeah, there there are uh, there are known schemes that are sort of laughable. There are schemes like this where you're like, that is clever. And I mean, I I could have been duped. I mean, I don't know what bank he was using, but this doesn't sound unlike the way that my bank would work the same way. Um, yeah, if somebody calls me from a bank, you know, somebody called me from my insurance company this morning. And like my first thing was like, what are you doing? Who are you? What do you want? You know, you and it really? was just, yeah, they were just like, oh, you should get a flu shot. But, but, you know, there is, you know, even if you err on the side of extreme paranoia, these sorts of things do, they, 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 they pass through and it, they fool a lot of people who, who are, are pretty well versed in technology and understanding that these things do exist. Yeah. Yeah. There are some numbers out there uh, from from Pew about uh, how prevalent this is, right? Yeah. In fact, it's not just phishing schemes, but it does give you a sense of uh, how much people really do get kind of confused about a lot of the stuff that we have to look out for. So Pew Research, uh, one of their they do studies on lots of stuff. Are a uh, a recent study of just over four thousand adults living in the U.S. conducted in June of this year. Uh, found that around 60% of U.S. adults say that they know about phishing scams. They know that phishing scams happen via email or text messages or social media or websites. 15% say they don't know where phishing scams occur. So it's not that they don't understand that they do occur, they just don't understand how to identify them. So again, you know, you look at both those numbers, you're like, okay, there's a good amount of people who are going to be fooled by these things, not because they're not smart, because they don't really understand what's going on here, you know, and, 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 uh, the, 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 the bank scam that we just read would, would, would be difficult for anybody. Uh, 29% of Americans correctly named WhatsApp and Instagram as two companies owned by Facebook, 29%. Think of all the people who don't understand you know, who is owned by Facebook. And I think that that's, you know, that was one of the, uh, the, the metrics where I was like, wow, you know, you can kind of in the work that we do, you can kind of laugh about that and be like, Oh, well, people kind of know, don't they? No, a lot of people don't know. And they don't necessarily care, 
but they might care later, you know, depending on, you know, how, how these companies go. 24% of Americans are aware that private browsing or incognito mode only hides online activity from other people who might be using the same computer. Doesn't mean that you're just private browsing and no one will ever see it. So again, that's a small amount of people who should kind of know how those sorts of things work when it comes to your privacy. Uh, about 63% of Americans understand that cookies are text files that allow websites to track user sites, site visits and activities. Okay, all right, so there's, you know, we've got some learning to do there. 48% of adults demonstrated understanding that a privacy policy is a contract between websites and users regarding how their data will be used. Again, that's less than 50% of people understanding privacy policies. You know, there's, uh, again, there's, you know, it's somewhat concerning. 45% know that net neutrality refers to the principle that internet service providers should treat all traffic on their networks equally. 30% of adults understand that a URL that starts with HTTPS means that the information entered on that site is encrypted. That's Something not a lot. That should no. be a little higher. That should be yeah. way higher. Yeah. Right? Yeah. 30%. It's, you know, you sort of, I, that's the sort of thing where it's like, I mean, I'm always looking at that. And I, I prefer using a browser that's going to warn me anytime that I'm not on, uh, you know, a site that, that is encrypted. Uh, finally, 28% uh, accurately identified an example of two-factor auth. So that, and that is perhaps the most glaring um, example of how much more, I don't know, public knowledge there needs to be about how, how these things work. Yeah, I don't it, think it, it would have me. It strikes me here that 60% know about phishing scams. Only 28% accurately identified two-factor authentication. Phishing actually has high awareness compared to a lot of this other stuff you were mentioning. Well, I think people know, oh, you know, they're, they'll, they'll, you better watch that email. They'll try to get you, you know, there are a lot of scams out there. I think people are aware of that, but yes, the fact that you can turn on two factor authentication to really help yourself, uh, privacy security wise is something that I think there's, I mean, there, we got it. We, well, we got a lot and, more and learning even, to do. Even with awareness of phishing, as we saw this person that did the, from from uh, the the CEO we were just talking about Peter Gunst, he knows about phishing and almost got fished. Like just right. being aware isn't enough. That's right. Yeah, I uh, just one time. I know we're almost out of time. So I just want to add a tiny little thing to this. I have a kid in the house. He's 19. He loves Instagram. He can't stand Facebook. When I asked him why, he says I don't like the company. I said, you know, Instagram's owned by Facebook. And he looked at me blindly for a while, and I went, oh my gosh, he doesn't know. So even this like really smart tech savvy kid mm -hmm. and his family which is very tech savvy we're always talking about this stuff even he didn't know so i, I felt like this little tiny little twinge of father failure like i hadn't really let him know <laughs> well it's also like the principle right like your son has has principles but at the same time he's like oh really oh shoot <laughs> i'm yep. gonna have to rethink some of these as, things as stoic squirrel said in the chat you can't know everything yeah. It's true, um, but we will we will push forward. Uh, thanks, everybody who participates in our subreddit. They help us know things every day. You can submit stories and vote on them. We'll read them. We will participate in them. We might even put them in a show, dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. We're also on Facebook. Join our group, facebook.com slash groups slash dailytechnewsshow. All right. Well, thank you, Scott Johnson, uh, for joining us today. Uh, thanks to our patrons at our master and grandmaster levels as well, including Jeff Wilkes, Ken Hayes, and Rushan Brantley. Our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Write us early and often and send us photos of your cats, or me anyway. We're live Monday through Friday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2030 UTC, and you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>